everyone. Morning, everyone. My mic on? Okay. <clears throat> Father, we're so thankful for your gospel that has saved us from our sins. We see this as a time for the redeemed to worship Christ because of what he has done for us, Lord. And so we pray that you can be pleased with what takes place this morning because we see this primarily being about you, so only secondarily about us. And we, but we do ask, Lord, that um, with the focus on you, you would continue that sanctifying work that only your word can accomplish. I pray that if there would be any unredeemed to join us, any unbelievers here, Lord, we thank you for their presence and pray that today could be the day of salvation for them, that you'd open their hearts to the gospel, uh, see their need to be saved, grant them repentance, faith in Christ. Thank you for these verses, Lord. I um, you know, came to them without a, uh, much enthusiasm associated with teaching them, but after spending the week in them, I am excited to share tr the truths that you've revealed to me, Lord, and pray that by your grace I could faithfully reveal them to your people who have come here. Give us eyes and ears to understand uh, hearts that receive your word planted in it. Uh, open us, spiritually speaking, to see and, and uh, understand the truths that are contained here, Lord, that they wouldn't be kept from us. And grow us in our love and affection for Christ, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen, amen. Sunday mornings, we're working our way through Luke's gospel, verse by verse, and we find ourselves at Luke 12, 54. Uh, it's good to see all of you. The title of this morning's sermon is, Make Every Effort to Settle with God. Make Every Effort to Settle with God. I really enjoy preaching verse by verse. I look forward each week to the new verses that I'll be um, laboring in. But one of the cautions is taking sections in chunks and failing to see their relationship to other passages that uh, precede or even follow the verses that we're looking at. We don't want to look at these uh, chunks of Scripture independent of the verses around them, or, or we could just say we don't want to look at these verses out of context. And so it's a good idea as we go verse by verse to consider the context. Let's do that briefly. Look back with me at verse 35. Verses 35 through 40, you probably have a heading in your Bible for this section, something about Christ's return. Uh, Jesus is telling the crowds that we must be ready. And then in verses 41 through 48, he talks about faithful servants who are ready when he returns and how they'll be blessed. And then he talks about unfaithful servants who are not ready when he returns and how they'll be punished. And then he continues in verses 49 through 53, which we covered last week, uh, talking about the purpose of his coming. But it's not exactly like we would tend to think, in particular, if you look at verse 51, he says, don't think that I've come to give peace, instead I came to bring division. We know other verses that tell us Jesus came to bring peace, and so how do we reconcile these uh, seemingly exclusive verse, mutually exclusive verses? And it's in appreciating that Christ came to reconcile us or bring peace between man and God, but in that reconciliation to God, we then at times find ourselves divided or separated from unredeemed man. So we could say that God brings peace between, or Christ came and brought peace between God and man, but also brings division between man and man when we're separated from unbelievers. And then he follows up with this morning's verses. So it's important to appreciate that these verses flow from the previous verses he's been teaching to the crowds. Uh, he's talking about discerning the time, discerning the time. And he uses two illustrations to stress the importance of discernment and diligence in spiritual matters. And to tell you ahead of time, the first illustration is discerning the weather, and then the second illustration is diligence in settling lawsuits. Let's take a look at the first illustration in verse 54. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. And so up to this point, there have been times that Jesus spoke directly to the disciples, and there are other times that he spoke to the crowds at large, and this is one of those times that he goes back to addressing not just the disciples, but all of the crowds present. So he wants everyone to be able to discern the time. This is something for uh, everyone to apply. Now, the first century, they had no uh, weather channel, didn't have any apps on their phone to tell them what the weather is going to be like, and so their predictions would come from the formation of clouds and winds. And Jesus' listeners knew that if a cloud formed in the west over the Mediterranean Sea, the rain was on the way. They knew that if the wind blew uh, south from the Arabian desert, that there was a heat wave coming. I was thinking about the account with Elijah. Remember, he had called for that drought, 
And then God tells him to, well, he tells his servant to go out because he knows it's going to begin raining. And listen to this. 1 Kings 18.43, Elijah said to his servant, go now, look out toward the sea. And he went out and he looked and he said, there's nothing. And Elijah said, go again. Seven times he did this. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, there's a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down lest the rain stop you. And so we have this example from the Old Testament of discerning the weather. And this continued, this approach, even until Jesus' day. But Jesus' commendation to them about being able to serve, or Jesus' commendation to them about being able to discern the weather is really just setting them up for this rebuke that he wants to deliver in verse 56. He says, <clears throat> you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? And so he rebukes these people because they knew how to discern the weather, but they didn't know how to discern the present time. And I want you to notice that it's not times or seasons singular, or it's not <laughs> times or seasons plurally. He's talking about a specific time. It's singular. The New King James says this time. The NIV Amplified and NASB say this present time. And so Jesus isn't talking about being able to discern multiple seasons or times of life. He's talking specifically about his day that he is with these people because of their inability to recognize that he is the Messiah. So he's rebuking them for not recognizing the time that God would come from heaven to earth and the person of Jesus Christ and walk among them. Really, he's rebuking them for not recognizing the most unique time in all of human history, which is when God came to earth. They in, in failing to see Jesus as the Messiah, they failed to discern this present time. If they knew as much about spiritual matters as they knew about the weather, then they would have embraced Jesus. And so there were certain things that they could tell well. They could tell when it was going to be hot outside. They could tell when the weather was going to change. They could tell when a storm was coming. If they were farmers, then they could tell good days for planting and good days for harvesting or bad days for planting and harvesting. But they couldn't tell when the Messiah was in their midst. And the application I see for us is how tragic is it today the number of things that man can do. It's really astonishing. I mean, you, you, we could go on and on about the amazing things that uh, man is able to do, predicting the movements of heavenly bodies. We have put people on the moon. We can launch these satellites, you know, into space. We can split atoms. We can perform heart transplants. I was listening to a doctor one time after he had performed this heart transplant, just watching this video of it, and he was talking about how each time he's amazed that he takes this heart that's not beating, puts it in this person's chest, I suppose, connects everything that has to be connected, and you can watch it on video, and then the heart starts beating, and he says, I'm even amazed by this, the things that we're able to do today. And so, in some sense, it's truly impressive because of the, the in intellect that God, the creativity that God has given to man uh, to be able to do these things, but then to be, to be that intelligent or that able in these other areas of life and yet be so blind to the things God is doing. To be able to do these things but be so blind to God and the work that he's doing in this world makes people as blind as the Jews in Jesus' day who couldn't see him as the Son of God. It's as though people know how to get to space, but they don't know how to get to what? <laughs> yeah, they don't know how to get to heaven. Now, let me get you to think about something. When our kids can't do something, we don't typically criticize them for it if they didn't know how to do it or there was no expectation for them to be able to do it. So instead, what we do is we teach them to do it. So for example, if the lawn isn't mowed, you're not going to rebuke your children for the, the lawn not being mowed you're going to teach, unless they've been taught to how, how to use the lawnmower, unless they've been taught to mow the lawn. If they haven't been taught that, then you're going to teach them to use a lawnmower. You're not going to rebuke your children if the dishes aren't done, if you've never taught them how to use the dishwasher or how to, how to wash dishes. And so instead, you're going to teach them how to do these things. Well, I mention that because it looks like Jesus is criticizing them for being unable to discern, to discern the time, but that's not really the case. Because you could look and say, well, why would he chastise them for being unable to discern the time if that's not something that they could do. He's rebuking them for not discerning the time because that was something that they should have been able to do. 
The only time we criticize our children is when the lawn isn't mowed and the dishes aren't done, when we have taught them to do these things. And Jesus is rebuking the crowds who are, pre who are present because they should have recognized that he was the son of God. They should have discerned the time. And why is that? They had been given the scriptures. They, they were the, the Jews were the ones that the uh, prophets belonged to them. They were the ones who were, who were hearing the teaching and the preaching from Christ. Just like the kids who've been taught to use the lawnmower or the dishwasher, these Jews have been taught the prophecies about the Messiah. They had the scriptures for centuries telling them about Christ coming. They should have interpreted them to understand that Jesus was the Messiah. And so why didn't they? Why didn't they? I mean, it really is kind of shocking to consider that Jesus could be in the midst of these people and they didn't recognize that he was the Messiah. Well, why didn't they? Is it just because he didn't reflect the, the prophecies or expectations of the day? That was part of it, but I think that these verses introduced something that to me was, was uh, somewhat new in understanding why they rejected Jesus, and it had to do with interest. That's the point that he's making. It had to do with interest. They were more interested in what? The weather than in the Son of God. That's the point that he's making. You care more about the weather, you spend more time thinking about it and focusing on it than you do spiritual matters, in this, which are of infinitely greater importance. And this brings us to lesson one. We should be more interested in spiritual matters than earthly matters. We should be more interested in spiritual matters than earthly matters. So we pay attention to the weather. It's not as though the weather is unimportant. It's just that spiritual matters are of infinitely greater importance. It's pretty easy to criticize the Jews because they had the Messiah, the Son of God, in their midst. He's teaching, uh, he's preaching, he's performing miracles, he's fulfilling prophecies, but they rejected him. And so they definitely look pretty bad. But we should think about the application for us. And for me, the question I'm asking myself is, what am I most interested in? What most captures my attention? What, what am I an expert on? What am I most familiar with? Because have you ever met people and they seem to be, um, let's just say, super good at certain things? Have you ever met people and like, a car drives by, they don't even have to look under the hood and they can tell what's wrong with it? You know, if, if it's making an odd sound, they're such experts on automobiles, they can very quickly tell you what needs to be fixed with that car. You're watching sports with certain people, and what can they tell you? They can tell you all these wild, specific statistics about the athletes or teams that they're watching. I mean, going back years or going back decades, you know, they can tell you when this person or, you know, who won the MVP or who, who won the home run derby or how many touchdowns in this season or in this Super Bowl or how many rushing yards, you know, you know going back 10, 15, 20 years. You have people and they'll hear a few seconds of a song and they can quickly finish those words. They can tell you the rest of the lyrics. They can, maybe they can even tell you, you know, the artist, the album, if that artist or that album won any awards that year. You have people and they're handy and they can look at projects and very quickly they can tell you exactly what needs to be done. They can tell you the tools that need to be used that you're going to need to acquire. If you're going to do this project, they're going to give you an, an estimate on the cost it's going to take to be able to do this. And this knowledge, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying that it's immoral. I'd say an amount of it is amoral, and then I would say an amount of it is moral. Some of it falls kind of in different categories. You know, you have the knowledge that's sort of fun. You have the knowledge that's interesting. You have the knowledge that's beneficial. You have some knowledge that's, that's lucrative. You have some people that are able to make an amount of money based on the knowledge that they have of certain things. And we should be knowledgeable about different things. There's nothing wrong with having lots of interests. There's nothing wrong with being educated and informed. There's nothing wrong with being able to do lots of different things. But the question is this. Are we most interested in spiritual matters? Are those the things that excite us the most? Are, are we most enthusiastic about the spiritual versus the earthly or the heavenly? What, what are we experts on? If someone was to talk to you and they were to recognize your area of expertise, would they be able to appreciate after spending enough time with you that as much of an expert as you are in this area, you're even more of an expert when it comes to Christ. 
You're even more of an expert when it comes to the gospel. Your ability to rightly divide God's word or to handle it well, to be able to answer spiritual questions. What do we know the most about? What gets us the most excited? It's kind of interesting the number of people who will criticize Christians for being fanatics. But really, it, you just kind of pan this, the stadium during sports games, and I think those people look considerably more fanatical, right? You know, you kind of like your team, and, and then you're becoming more of a fan, and the next thing you know, you're sitting there at the, at the stadium, and you've got your face painted, and you've bought all these silly things to hold up and cheer, cheer for your team. And I mean, if I was going to think about people that are fanatical, that's, that's who seems pretty fanatical to me. And I'm not even saying you can't like sports. I'm not saying you can't have a, a favorite team, but I just would ask if people looked at, at our lives, my life included, and they wanted to consider what I was a fan of, and they said, you know, Pastor Scott, he's pretty fanatical, what would they say about what? You know, fill in the blank there. Are, I'm asking myself, are they going to say Christ? Do I seem fanatical about Christ? Do I seem fanatical about my faith and about the Word of God? To apply this to our lives, I'll ask this, what is the weather for you? What is the weather for you? Is it sports? Is it cars or trucks, automobiles? Is it music? Is it politics? There are some people, and it's, I mean, isn't that one of the things? It's, it's almost inevitable that it's going to come up in conversation, politics. When Katie and I were going over the sermon, she said, it's pretty interesting that Jesus used the weather here because it seems like when two people are looking at each other and they can't figure out what to talk about, they're going to bring up the weather, right? <laughs> and if they don't bring up the weather, then they're going to bring up politics. So is it going to be politics? Is it going to be the stock market? Is it going to be the news? And it's fine knowing about these things. It's fine talking about these things. It's fine being informed, but are we more interested in them than we are in heavenly or spiritually spiritual matters? Now let's look at Jesus' second illustration about settling a legal dispute. In verse 57, he says, Why do you not judge... For yourselves what is right in this verse the word judge has more the idea of deciding or figuring out not judging um, like to condemn sin or thinking of a judge in a courtroom imagine jesus is saying this instead he says why can't you people decide for yourselves what is right why can't you figure out the right thing to do that's what jesus is saying he's talking about a situation which we're about to talk about in verses 58 and 59 that is currently unresolved in the Jews' lives and could very well be unresolved in our lives. And it's as though Jesus is speaking to these crowds and could very well be speaking to us, saying, why can't you figure this out? Why have you not decided for yourselves what is right? Why is this not a resolved issue for you? So you're saying, well, what is the situation that they haven't decided about or they haven't resolved yet? That's what Jesus talks about in the next verse. He's talking about them being foolish because of this situation that's unresolved for them. They should have determined the right thing to do by this point. And here's the situation in verse 58. He says, as you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and the officer put you in prison. Now, this illustration, just to tell you ahead of time so you can understand as we talk about it in more detail, is about getting right with God before we stand before him and are judged. This illustration is to the Jews was about them getting right with God before they stand before him, but it has just as much application for us today as it had for the crowds in his day. I want to give you a few things in your Bible that you can circle that'll make this illustration even clearer for you. So if you want to circle the word accuser, then draw a line and write the word devil. Circle the word accuser, draw a line and write the word devil. You can circle the word judge. You can draw a line and you can write God. And then you can circle the word prison and you can draw a line and you can write hell. Now, let's talk about the devil first, or let's talk about the accuser first. And this is particularly fitting because the devil's name means accuser. Revelation 12.10 says the accuser of our brothers, referring to the devil, he's been thrown down. He had been accusing them day and night before our God. What book of the Bible do we most clearly get to see the devil acting as that accuser? In the book of Job, right? 
Job, this is one of those instances I kind of read this and I'm like, God, just please don't mention me to the devil. <laughs> you know, just don't bring up my name to him. Job 1.8, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and unright man who fears God and turns away from evil? It's almost like God's sort of dangling Job out there. And then Satan answers, does Job fear you for no reason? He begins accusing him. Haven't you put a hedge around him and his house and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands. You've blessed his possessions. They've increased in the land. But if you stretch out your hand and you touch all that he has, he's going to curse you to your face. So God says Job is this godly man, but the devil accuses Job of only being a godly man because God has blessed him so much. But if God is to take away these things, the devil says at least, if God is to take away these things from Job, then no longer will Job bless God. And the devil was wrong in his accusations about Job because those things were taken away and Job's faith was in, in the Lord was maintained. Another day comes along, Job 2, 3, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? None like him on the earth, blameless, upright, fears God, turns away from evil. He still holds fast to his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered, he said, skin for skin. All that a man has, he'll give for his life. But if you stretch out your hand and you touch Job's bone in his flesh, he's going to curse you to your face. So again, God holds, out God's, God holds out Job's godliness before the devil. And the devil says, sure, he's been a godly man, but that's only because he hasn't suffered physically. And if he suffers physically, then sure enough, he's going to curse you. So you just hear the, the ugly, vile accusations that the devil is bringing against Job. And again, he ends up being wrong. Listen to another verse about the devil. John 8, 44. The devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. So the verse says the devil is a liar, he's the father of lies, and then there's one part of the verse that I really question how literally this should be taken. It says that there's no truth in the devil. Now, the other day, we were doing a Bible study as a family, and we were looking at Genesis 3, and in my mind, what is particularly uh, terrifying about the devil's interaction with Eve is that there was an amount of truth in what the devil said, right? Isn't that what makes... Um, lies so hard to discern when they're blended with an amount of truth. We looked at a fam as a family, and I had my, asked my children, what is the truth that you see in the devil's words to Eve? And really, his statements are just uh, filled with truths. Well, so I don't think it's that literal. And I'll tell you another time when the devil can tell the truth, or he doesn't have to be lying, and that's when he accuses me. When he talks about my sin to God, when, when he brings uh, my sin before the Lord, he doesn't have to lie. And guess what? When the devil talks about you and the things that you've done, he doesn't have to lie either. Now, maybe he, maybe he does offer some lies. Maybe he brings some accusations about me before God, and maybe they're laced with some truth, but there's some things that perhaps he's wrong about. But I know this, that if he wanted to accuse me of different things, if he wanted to make me sound terrible, the devil could do that, and he could be telling the truth. When he accuses me at least one time, that's at least one time he doesn't have to lie. I read a quote that said something like, don't get too upset when people talk bad about you because you're actually a lot worse than they think. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good uh, uh, truth to keep in mind and al allow us to stay humble. And so I don't, I don't know how much, you know, the devil lies. I don't know how many words he says that, that, that are uh, deceitful, but I know that there are plenty of things he could say about me when, uh, and to condemn me and be telling the truth. Listen to these verses, and in particular, the two questions that, that Paul asks. Romans 8, 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? Uh, these aren't rhetorical questions. Who brings a charge or who brings an accusation against God's elect? Who condemns? What's the answer to that? It's not rhetorical. The devil. The accuser is the one who's bringing these charges or accusations against us. And who does he accuse us to or who does he bring these charges to? He could bring them to our minds, I suppose. He could try to uh, make us who are in Christ feel condemned for our sins as though we haven't really been forgiven and Christ hasn't really taken the punishment that we deserve. 
But in this context, the idea is he's bringing these charges to God. God is the judge in this illustration. And all of us, if you think about this illustration, are on our way to God. We are on our way to stand before him. Have you ever thought that every single day of your life is one day closer to standing before God? Every single breath we take is one more breath closer to that day that we stand before God. So just like this illustration uh, Jesus taught, all of us are heading that way. You could say we're heading, to, we're, on, we're heading toward the courtroom where we will see the judge. And there is an accuser who's going with us, accusing us to bring us before that judge. And because the accusations against us are true, we are going to be condemned. We, have, we don't have a defense. We are not going to be able to stand before God and, and provide any sort of excuse for, this, for the wickedness that we have engaged in, the sins that we have committed. We're not going to be able to shift blame and say, well, this happened to me when I was a child, or there was this situation, or I was so upset when this trial wasn't brought into my life, or there were these circumstances that caused me to do that. When you read Revelation 20, which is the great white throne judgment, when all unbelievers throughout all human history are resurrected to stand before this throne that the Lord sits on, you can tell that this is a sentencing. There's no deliberation. It's not a hearing. These are people that are standing because they're about to be condemned and cast alive into the lake of fire. And so that's why we should make every effort to do what? Before we reach God, make every effort to what? Settle with him. And this brings us to lesson two. Make every effort to settle with God before standing before him. Make every effort to settle with God before standing before him. Looks like we're getting a little more creative with our slides up here, Isaac. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, Isaac, there you go. Man, it's getting no more excited as what's, what they're going to see next week, you know. So now you're kind of setting a bar that you're going to have to live up to week after week with your, with your creative slides. So the main point of Jesus' illustration is, I believe, pretty clear. We are on our way to the judge, and we should make every effort to settle before we stand before him. And I want to give you one more thing to circle in your Bible. In verse 58, circle the words, settle with him, draw a line, and write, make peace. Circle the words, settle with him, draw a line, and write, make peace. If you wanted another word, you could even put reconciled. We need to make peace with God before we stand before him. And it's interesting because even in the secular world, it could, it could even be foul movies that none, none necessarily come to mind, but this is very common language. You, you know, you could see in, in, in ungodly movies where there's some, uh, you know, I've only heard that these are the sorts of things in ungodly movies, not like I've seen it myself or something. You know, there's somebody who's about to kill someone else, and right before they kill him, what do they tell him? You need to make peace with God. You need to make your peace with God. It's like, it's just bound up in man's heart, this recognition that we are going to stand before God someday, that he is going to judge us, and we need to make peace with him. And that's what's in view here. Jesus' illustrations and parables, they used these very ordinary, there's, not, there's nothing that Jesus used that an, as an illustration in a, or in a parable that any regular person would have listened to and said, I don't know what he's talking about. That doesn't make sense to me. Every, he used constantly these very common, ordinary scenarios and situations, earthly ones, to illustrate physical, heavenly truths. You know, whether it's a sower, everyone pictures someone going, going and sowing like that. Everyone pictures someone petitioning a judge asking for, asking for justice. So always, always simple parables. And this illustration is like that because in ordinary life, even in our day, we recognize that if we're involved in legal, disp legal disputes and we are the accused and we also happen to be what? Guilty. The accusations against us are legitimate. Then the best thing we can do is try to settle out of court. Because if it goes to trial, we're going to be found guilty and it's going to be even worse for us. So if I put this in the modern day vernacular, it's almost like Jesus says this, you better do everything you can to settle outside of court because if this reaches the judge, it is not going to go well for you. And the spiritual application is if we wait, which many people do, 
to get right with God when they stand before him, then it is going to be too late. You don't start studying for the test when the test starts, right? You don't start practicing for the big game when the game is about to start. And you don't wait to get right with God or make peace with him right before you're about to stand before him. William Hendrickson said, Jesus is winding up his address with a dramatic appeal to every listener, urging him to make his peace with God and to do so now before it is too late. To each person, Jesus is saying, be reconciled to God. Look one chapter to the right at Luke 13. One chapter to the right at Luke 13. Verse 34, to see Jesus making this similar uh, point. These verses came to mind because I, I sense Christ's heart, his uh, strong appeal, his strong desire here to make peace with these people. He says, oh, in verse 34, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Verse 35, behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I believe referring to the second coming. So Jesus is saying that he wanted to make peace with these Jews. Do you hear that? Do you see his heart in these verses? He's appealing to them. He's saying, I'm like a chicken that just wanted to gather my hens under the wings, or so that I gather the chicks under my wings so that I could protect you. I didn't want you to be harmed. Jesus knew that the Roman armies were coming, that they were going to destroy the city and the temple, but the Jews would not what? They would not seek for terms of peace. They would not settle outside of court. They were marching toward judgment. God was the judge, and they wouldn't settle with him, and be, instead they ended up being judged or punished by the Romans. And there was a far worse judgment punishment that was awaiting them after this life was over. And if you want to see how bad it is to stand before the judge without settling first, look at verse 59. Jesus says, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. So Jesus is reminding us of the great penalty of not settling or not making peace before the day of judgment. All this is meant to impress upon us the urgency associated with getting right with God now and not putting it off. People will do almost anything to stay out of prison. My dad worked for the Department of Corrections for uh, most of his life, I think almost 40 years. And it just, it, he didn't, I, I really can't tell you much about it. Many fathers come home and they want to talk to their children about their profession, things they saw at, at work. I, I'm, I cannot even remember one single time the dad came home and talked to me about prison. It, it was just such an unpleasant, miserable experience just to work there, not even to be in prison, that he never shared it with us. Well, people will go to great lengths, understandably, to stay out of prison. And what's my point? There is an infinitely worse prison that is awaiting people that they make no effort to avoid. I mean, an earthly prison would be paradise compared to the prison for people who do not make peace with God and are not reconciled with Him. I mean, the, the people who will spend eternity crying out while in the lake of fire w would give anything to come and spend, and spend their eternities in an earthly prison that would be infinitely easier and better than what they're experiencing. And this brings us to lesson three people can't settle their debt in hell. People can't settle their debt in hell. Just a few verses about the horrors of hell. I was, as I gathered these verses, one of the things that I noticed that was repeated was really the eternal nature of it, that it is unending, that nobody escapes from it. Just listen to some of these verses. And I am sharing all this with you to, to make a point in a moment. I want you to have these verses to be able to interpret this verse correctly. So just as life in heaven is eternal, the punishment in hell is eternal. Matthew 25, 46, the unrighteous will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So eternal punishment. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, the unrighteous will suffer the eternal punishment or 
will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Mark 9, 48, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched there. It seems that it's burning forever. People experience unending torment. Just as the righteous are resurrected and receive new bodies, we don't talk about this as much, but it's important to understand that the unrighteous also receive resurrected bodies, not glorified bodies, but it seems to me that they are resurrected bodies because you could say, well, how could someone spend eternity in the lake of fire? You, you just must receive some sort of special body for that. In John 5, 29, it says people are going to come out of the grave, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. We don't typically think of resurrection for unbelievers or resurrection bodies for the unrighteous, but it seems they receive them as well to be able to uh, survive, for lack of a better way to say it, eternity in hell. Acts 24, 15, there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And I meant, I mean, you know, I, I'm your pastor. I am for you. How terrible would it be if you were to sit under my ministry for some period of time, hear these verses about hell and not make things right with God? How could you listen to these verses and just not be terrified if you haven't repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ? And this isn't, this isn't in my notes. I, did, I write everything out pretty scriptedly, but I just share these verses and the burden that I have for all of you that you could possibly sit there and listen to me share these verses and have not made things right with God. How could you hear about the horrors of hell and not, and not just be terrified of, of that judgment? And when Christ offers you his righteousness, he offers to receive the punishment you deserve. Who, who wouldn't want that? How could that be unattractive to someone? The only thing that I can imagine is you would listen to this and you would think, well, at this point in my life, I just want to continue to hold to my sin. I want to keep living for myself I do not want to surrender my life to Christ. And then you think, well, there will be some point in the future when I'll, when I'll have the potential to do so. And, and then this is when pastors, they come up with this. And I'm not saying it's not true. They'll say something like, how do you know that you're not going to get in an accident when you leave the church today on your way home and die? That could possibly happen. I don't usually make that appeal, though, because I don't think it's the most terrifying one. Here's what I think is the most terrifying. Why... Would any of you think that if you say no to Christ today, that you will be more receptive to him next week? Why would you think that your heart is going to be softer and more tender in the future if you say no to him now? And that's what's terrifying, because our hearts get harder. If you say no today, it will be harder to say yes later. And that's what's terrifying. That's what people need to think about, that every single time you put that off, you become a little bit more like Pharaoh, and you harden your own heart, and you become more unreceptive to Christ. This is as easy as it gets for you. It will never be easier than this. If you do not want to surrender your life to Christ now, why should you think that you will surrender your life to him in the future? My suspicion is you won't, or God will have to introduce something terribly difficult into your life to bring you to your knees to get you to look up. And that's something that you shouldn't want either. Now, I mentioned these verses because I want you to have the correct understanding of verse 59. If you looked at verse 59 in isolation, which we shouldn't do, we always want to consider context or we want to let the Bible interpret the Bible. If you looked at verse 59 in isolation, then you could think that hell is something that comes to an end when you pay off your debt, right? That's kind of how it looks. But we know from all the verses that I just read, as well as other verses in Scripture, that hell is eternal. People never escape from it. It never comes to an end. And the prison that Jesus is referring to, this is what makes it very fitting. Because Jesus says, Jesus, he's not trying to get you to think that hell can come to an end. By mentioning that you have to pay off the last penny, Jesus' listeners would understand that he's talking about the debtor's prison. He's talking about the prison in his day. We don't have debtor's prison today. You just file for bankruptcy. But in Christ's day, when people had debts that they couldn't pay, they were thrown into prison until that debt was paid. 
but herein is the problem we can never pay off our sin debt so it is very fitting for Jesus to be talking about a prison for people in debt because we are in debt payment for sin is required but we can't make that payment you can pay off all of your financial debt you cannot pay off any of your sin debt and this is why people can never escape hell because they can never pay their debt and so that brings up the question how are we going to make things right with God how are we going to be at peace with him before we stand before him if we cannot pay the debt that we owe and this brings us to lesson four only Christ can pay our debt only Christ can pay our debt now most people even those who are unchurched are familiar with what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer and in that prayer most of us have prayed this many times Matthew 6 12 forgive us what forgive us our debts forgive us our debts we live in a world that is convinced that the way to go to heaven is by being good by earning it by doing enough good works and I don't fault anyone for believing this because I believe this for a little over 20 years of my life I mention it because it occurred to me that it's very ironic that people would think this when what is probably the most famous prayer in history that even unbelievers and unchurched people know tells us to pray that God would forgive our debts versus us working off our debt what people are most familiar with the Lord's Prayer does not tell us to work off our debt to have it forgiven instead we are just to pray that God forgives it Jesus wasn't referring to anything financial but spiritual the sin debt we have against God now if we have a financial debt if you have enough time or you're given enough money or you work hard enough to obtain that money on your own you can pay off that debt but our sin debt is one we can't pay off it doesn't it doesn't matter how much time we have it doesn't matter how much how hard we work it doesn't ha matter how much money we are given and we have this debt whether what whether we're rich whether we're poor whether we're young whether we're old whether we're married whether we're single whether we're parents whether we're children and what can we do about it we can pray to have it forgiven think of the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18 verses 23 to 27 records this the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants when he began to settle one of the servants was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents which would be an unimaginable amount of debt a debt that even someone in Jesus day would recognize nobody could really accrue and it says this since he could not pay and I thought that was very fitting it says that he could not pay this debt because we can't pay our debt his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and a payment to be made and so the servant he falls to his knees and he implores his master and he says have patience with me and I will pay you everything which was a lie he's just desperate at this point he just doesn't want to suffer and his wife and his children to suffer and so he's just begging him he says just give me enough time and I'll pay you everything which he would he knows he would never be able to do and out of pity for him the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt and so this man he had a debt he could not pay he falls to his knees he begs the king he cries out to him and the king does the unimaginable he forgives him that debt and that man he represents us his debt represents our sin debt his desperation and fear represents the desperation and fear we should experience associated with our sin debt and the way that he falls to his knees and he cries out to the king for mercy is the same way that we should fall to our knees and we should cry out to God for mercy regarding the debt that we have because there's nothing we could do about it giving all of our all of our effort all of our life we could not even pay off one sin and so what did the servant do to be forgiven he did nothing more than acknowledge his debt humble himself and pray for mercy which is the same thing we do now we know the accuser he wants to take us to court he wants to have us stand before the judge 
He wants to bring all of his terrible and true accusations against us. I mean, have you ever thought of that? That when you stand before God someday, he is not going to have a difficult time. In Revelation 20, it talks about all the books that are opened. It says one of them is the Bible. So the rest of them are, seem to be the records of our lives. Is God going to have to, at least in my life, God is not going to have to look very hard to find bad things that I've done. And so the accuser wants to bring us before him, stand before God, bring these accusations against us, but we can have a lawyer. We can have an advocate who will defend us. 1 John 2, 1, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now that Greek word for advocate, it refers to a person a defense lawyer who would step in on behalf of the accused person to defend their case for them. And we're told that this is what we have in Christ. We have someone who will defend us. We have someone who will advocate for us. He's not someone who's going to stand there and say, no, don't punish Scott for his sins because he has been a good person. Don't believe those accusations. He has been so righteous. That's not what he's going to say. He's going to stand there and he's going to say, you do not punish Scott for what he's done. He does not deserve punishment any longer. He did deserve punishment. I received the punishment that he deserved. There was wrath against him. He has done all of these terrible things. He has committed all of this wickedness. He has lived in rebellion. Every single thing that the accuser would say about him is true. But he should not be punished because I have received all of the punishment that Scott deserves when I hung on that cross in his place. And I want to conclude by tying all these verses together. If we knew a storm was coming, we would prepare, right? If we knew a storm was coming, we would prepare. If we knew the accuser was coming to take us before the judge, we would get a lawyer and we would try to settle that case out of court because we know how bad it's going to be for us if this thing goes to trial. But here's the thing. There is a storm coming. There is the storm of God's wrath that is against us. According to James 5.9, it says that the judge is standing at the door already. We must get right with God, and we can do that through repentance and faith in our advocate, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the advocate you have provided, for that defense attorney who would stand in on our behalf, who would intercede for us and, and mediate for us to the judge. We thank you that even though there could be plenty of terrible accusations brought against us, that the devil himself wouldn't even have to lie to discuss the horrible things that we've done, that Jesus has taken the punishment for those, for those sins, at least for those who have, been, who have repented and put their faith in him. And we would pray for those who haven't made things right with you, Lord. If there'd be anyone today and they haven't settled out of court yet, we would pray that it doesn't reach trial, that they don't have to stand before you wishing that they would have made things right on this side of heaven. And so I thank you for this illustration, Lord, not one that I'd uh, given an, an amount of attention to prior to this week's study, but I'm thankful for it, Lord. It ministered to me. I pray that it would minister to your people, and, and should any of them have not reconciled with God outside of, uh, reconciled with you outside of court, that that's something you would convict them about this morning, Lord. We thank you for your son, what he has done for us, how he stands in on our behalf and advocates for us. What a wonderful blessing that is, Lord, and we pray these things in his name. Amen.